military and as a provider of continuing education for the College of Southern Idaho, the Idaho Association of Tax Consultants, the Idaho Society of CPAs, and the tax section of the American Bar Association. And he also provides informational workshops for agricultural employers, H2A and B workers, and social service agencies helping low-income and non-English speaking populations. Um, I'm going to add here that Bob had just a little while ago sent me some handouts uh, that correspond to the presentation he's going to give. And if anybody wants those, to please email. You can email me, Danny M at legalaidnc.org, and we can pour those to you. So uh, I am very happy to present you, Bob Wonderly. All yours, Bob. Okay, thank you. Let's see if I can figure out how to get these slides to change. There's just a little contact information on myself. If I don't get to answer all your questions uh, during the presentation, please feel free to send me an email or give me a call. Uh, just a brief history. Foreign workers have been coming into work in agriculture since the Bracero program set up in World War II. Its peak year was in 1956, when over 445 Braceros entered the U.S. The number of illegals who entered the U.S. during the tenure of the Bracero program was equal to or surpassed by the number of Braceros. The workers coming in have been exempt from FICA, which now includes Medicare tax by statute, and from federal income tax withholding by Treasury regulations derived from statute. Workers have never been exempt from income taxes, but IRS publications ex obscured that fact. Now, prior to 2011, IRS was telling employers they could not withhold income tax, they could not report wages on a W-2, they should report wages on a 1099 miscellaneous. And often this would show up as non-employee compensation. Guidance specified other income starting in 2009. This guidance was not in IRS publications. Many employers were not reporting the wages, but the pubs now require wage reporting on a W-2 and allow workers to volunteer for tax withholding. The Affordable Care Act was effective in 2014, and most of you know a lot more about this than I do. All persons with legal presence in the U.S., including an H-2A worker, must have health insurance or pay a penalty tax. Applicable large employers must provide insurance for their employees. What is an ALE? On average, if you have 50 full-time employees or full-time equivalents, unless state law differs and California has different rules. Full-time is defined as 30 hours a week and H-2A workers are almost always included in this count. There are exemptions available to H-2A workers from the shared responsibility penalty tax. These exemptions kick in if their household or gross income is less than the filing requirement or filing threshold. It kicks in for short coverage gaps, that is a gap of less than three consecutive months. So if they get here in the middle of March, they actually don't have to have their coverage starting until the 1st of June, and they can get an exemption for April and May. Non-resident aliens, including a dual status alien, and I'm going to just tell you what that is later in the presentation. In their first year of residence are exempt, including non-resident aliens who elect to file a joint return with a U.S. spouse. Again, these are terminologies that I will explain later on. Anyone who forms a non-resident return is automatically given an exemption. The interesting part about these exemptions for non-resident aliens is the fact that you won't find it in code anywhere. It is something the IRS has put on its website, but it's not written in code. Another possible 
exemption is if coverage is unaffordable and also for hardships. And there's a note page uh, later in the presentation that if you pick up the handouts from Danny, you'll see hardships defined. Employers are often looked at by farm advocacy groups as bad guys. From the employer's perspective, though, you've got to understand that H-2A employers are subjected to burdensome regulations and inspections by the department. For decades, they were concerned with regulations. Okay, sit tight, folks. We're working on getting Bob's audio back. Sorry about that. Did you lose my audio? Now we've got you. Can everyone hear Bob? Okay, where did okay. you drop? When did I drop off? Uh, the previous, the previous uh, slide, at least. <coughs> on this one. Uh, yeah. Okay, basically the story here is that most H-2A employers that I deal with are very supportive of their workers, respect their workers, are very grateful to having their workers. They are all those subject to what amounts almost to harassment by the Department of Labor in making sure through their inspections that all employers are complying with the rules of the H-2A program. And these rules can get very difficult and workers get, and the employers can face heavy fines for making any kind of mistake. Uh, so I always like to try to use the employer as a, an advocate as well for the workers because it's in their best interest to make sure that their workers' taxes are taken care of. Now, most employers maybe know about the exemption from withholding federal income taxes, but they're not aware that they, workers have to pay income tax even though they don't withhold. Many don't know that workers needed to have a social security number. That ignorance is slowly being dispelled but I still when I go out and speak find employers who don't know and I've had a couple call in this year for information whose workers have been coming up for a decade or more and still didn't have a social security card they do not need that social security number before they start working it's not required that they have one but they will need it by time they have to have a W-2 reported. So here is the SSA guidance for employers. Their responsibility is to advise workers to apply for a social security number. They are not required to take them there. They are not required to provide the transportation. But the fact of the matter is, if the employer doesn't provide that transportation and get them there, who will? There are some rules to follow. You have to have a 10-day rule. That means you wait 10 days after the worker enters the U.S. to apply. And this delay is needed to ensure that the Social Security Administration will receive the information from the Department of Homeland Security that the worker has legally entered the country, and then they can verify the documents. There's also a 14-day rule, which as a rule of thumb, I tell employers to make it a 30-day rule. 
because the SSA will not accept an application if a worker has less than 14 days of authorized U.S. presence remaining on the visa. And we have seen them reject, even though they had more than 14 days when they applied, but by time the SSA got around to processing the application, there were less than 14 days left and the application was turned down. When you fill out the application, I just won't spend much time here, but be careful. Most Latin American, Mexican, South American H-2A workers have two last names. It doesn't matter if you use the social security application in Spanish or English. It has three boxes for names. And very often we see the primary last name in the middle name box. And then when they start to file taxes, you get into trouble. Many times, even when the name is correct on the social security card, employers will use as a middle name, and I've seen it both ways, sometimes they use the primary name as a middle name, sometimes they'll take the secondary last name and use it as a middle initial. Uh, I don't understand why that happens, but it's lack of understanding, I guess, of the culture in Latin American and South American countries. Here's a brief rundown on the information return reporting requirements that employers are obliged to take care of. They're supposed to report all foreign worker in wages on a W-2. If the worker has applied but doesn't have a social security number when wage, wage reports are due, paper filers can enter applied for in box A of the W-2. Electronic filers enter all zeros. And then they're supposed to submit a W-2C or a corrected W-2 when they receive the worker's social security number. If a worker has not yet applied, I've given you a link that you can actually look. It's the internet on an internet search. It'll take you to Cornell University's law school website that tells you exactly what the employer has to do in various situations. There are penalties for employers who fail to file these information returns on a before the prescribed date. For returns due after 1231 last year, the penalties were increased. They can be hefty. $50 per return if filed within 32, 30 days of the due date. That means if you don't get it in on January 31st, you don't get it until February 28th, it's $50 per return. It goes up to a $100 return after 30 days and up to August 31st. Then it goes up to $250 per return. And if it is due to intentional disregard, it's $500 per return. Similar penalties apply if the employer fails to provide a timely statement to the worker. So when and where do these W-2s have to be sent in? For 2016, all W-2s and future years must be mailed and given to the taxpayer and submitted to Social Security Administration not later than January 31st. And we did have a question on the failure to file penalties about state law. I am discussing today, for the most part, federal law. There are too many states for me to keep up with all their individual requirements. Uh, so I'll have to pass on that one. <coughs> Technically, the W-2 should be sent to the taxpayer's home address, but practically it's often better to use an address where the taxpayer will actually receive correspondence. And we've never heard of a penalty being assessed against an employer for not having the worker's 
correct address, that is the permanent home address on a W-2. And here's the issue, receiving mail is a problem. IRS and state tax agencies will send mail to the address on the most recent tax return or W-2 they've received. If this is a U.S. address, the worker should make arrangements to ensure that mail is forwarded when he's not there to someone or someplace where he can get it. We also recommend that the worker authorize someone trusted to open mail and call them with important information in that correspondence. This authorization should be in writing. It doesn't have to be very formal. Just a small, a single statement authorizing this, whoever the person is, whether it's an employer, a friend, someone who works at the farm year round to assist in this. If the address on the W-2 is a foreign address, we sometimes have a problem. Does the worker's employer and tax preparer have a valid mailing address? Is mail delivery to that address reliable? And again, will tax authorities make unwarranted assumptions about the tax return because of the main home address? You put a foreign address on a W-2 and the mindset is someone who lives outside the country year round they're a non-resident alien, and they should never be doing a Form 1040. If you want to address... Uh, on, on line four, uh, it's Norma, and she's calling on an H-2A worker. Uba está en una conferencia. Oh, sorry. Uh, excuse me. I was just interrupted by a page. Sorry. <laughs> If practical, you might consider filing a change of address with the IRS and state agency when they leave and upon return. But I don't think too many people do that, and I'm not sure it's very practical. Here are some other issues that employers are concerned with, especially if they haven't been uh, properly reporting wages in the past. Uh, wages paid to a non-resident alien are often considered to be subject to 30% withholding because they're foreign workers. But if they are H-2A workers, they are not subject to that under Internal Revenue Code 1441. They are not to be reported on Forms 1042 or 1042S. These forms are to be used to report wages earned by alien taxpayers in legally in the US who by statute are exempt from the substantial presence test which determines residency. This typically applies to students, guest uh, teachers, visiting scholars. Wages paid to resident alien workers like H2As and H2Bs are subject to backup withholding if the worker fails to provide a social security number or an I-10. When you have that situation, you re do the backup withholding on a 1099 and not a Form W-2. And employers who fail to do backup withholding, when required, will be held liable for the amount of the backup withholding. There's pretty much a big safe harbor, though, for employers in this area. And generally, we do not recommend backup withholding even if they don't. We recommend against backup withholding even if they don't have a number when it's time to file. I have already given you a reference with all of the options available to the employer to avoid that backup withholding. Now, who is responsible for H-2A workers' tax compliance? It's not the employer. Our government expects all U.S. workers with a filing requirement to file and pay taxes. We are all supposed to know that we have that requirement, no matter where we come from or how long we've been in the U.S. 
That is the official U.S. and IRS policy. Unfortunately, no government agency provides outreach to H-2A workers or any other guest worker, for that matter, about their tax obligations. When visas are issued, all guest workers are given a briefing as a result of the Wilberforce Act. This is a warning against human trafficking. In that briefing, H-2A workers are told that they are exempt from Social Security and Medicare taxes. That's the only mention of taxes, and other workers who get that briefing do not have anything in it about income taxes. They are not told they're exempt from anything. But they are nobody is told what their responsibilities are under U.S. tax law. We've had many H-2A workers come to us with these pamphlets they were given when they got their visa and said, it says right here, I'm exempt from all taxes. That's not what it said, but that's what they understood it to mean. Compounding all of these difficulties, tax law for guest workers is very complicated. Very few tax preparers know it. Very few workers know it. And few IRS employees know it. The challenges occur because the tax professional who know the law are very rare. But there is a pandemic problem throughout the country of incompetent, ignorant, and fraudulent tax preparers seeking out guest workers and immigrant taxpayers generate to generate business and filing fraudulent returns, especially when it comes to the child tax credit and additional child tax credit. Tax law itself is exceedingly complex. Insurance exchange employees general, generally do not understand the guest worker program. Uh, we've had many reports that when they ask about visas, they're looking for F1 or F2 or J1 visas. They're not familiar with H2A and H2B visas. I had a caller, an employee, an employer call me just yesterday saying, I went on to the Marketplace Exchange and they said my worker was eligible for Medicaid so he couldn't have health insurance. And I had to explain, well, you have to pick up the phone and talk to one of the navigators and try to work through that because we both know that the H-2A workers are not eligible for Medicaid. Again, the big challenge no government agency provides outreach to H-2A workers about their tax obligations. It may be someplace on the do list for the IRS, but frankly, they probably don't have the funding to make it happen. The workers you see in the field when you go out will have limited or no knowledge of tax law, or they will have net knowledge of tax law, which is badly misinformed. As previously mentioned, they're told they're exempt from Social Security when they come in, but nothing about income taxes. Many know others who have worked in the U.S. for generations and never filed tax returns, and now they don't understand why me. Some have worked here for generations with fellow family members, never received a W-2 or 1099. And some believe they are entitled to refundable credits, such as the child tax credit and the additional child tax credit, because others they know have been getting it. And the IRS does not have a strong program to prevent it. I'm going to just go very quickly of some of the problems. Uh, they get correspondence and it never reaches them or it reaches them and they don't do anything with it. We've had workers come in with substitute returns prepared by the IRS and the first anybody knew about it is when the employer received a levy notice. 
And those that do come into filing compliance who have not are going to be hit with late filing and late payment penalties. We can usually get these abated, but it's not easy and it takes perseverance. The first time you request an abatement for a worker who owes for two or three years and has been assessed late filing penalties, the IRS will generally give a first time abatement for that taxpayer on the very first year he filed, but then say, well, you should have known for the other years and no abatement's possible. Well, you can appeal that and eventually get it, but you'll have to find someone who will do it. And the cost effectiveness of trying to fight those penalties, if he has to pay, if the worker has to pay someone to help him with that, uh, usually isn't worth it. There are other alternatives to full payment, and those include installment agreements and not collectible status and offers in compromise. This is what knowledgeable guest preparers, knowledgeable preparers are rare. When they do go, then I've seen it by CPAs, I've seen enrolled agents do this. They file guest workers as single with no dependents, even if the worker is married and has dependents, simply because the spouses and dependents are not in the US or don't have tax ID numbers. They'll file a H-2A worker as a non-resident with no standard deduction, even if he's been here 10 or 11 months and the correct filing would be as a resident with the standard deduction. They won't know if or when an H-2A worker may be eligible to claim the earned income credit without children. And they don't know anything about the residency tests for guest workers. They confuse immigration and tax law on this point and feel if he's on a non-immigrant visa, he must be a non-resident, but that is not true. And dishonest preparers are prevalent. They will file resident returns for non-resident workers. They will encourage workers to claim anybody's children for exemptions, and they will help them get tax ID numbers for those children. They will claim the child tax credit for children living outside the U.S. who are not U.S. citizens. This is a pandemic problem. It impacts all foreign-born taxpayers and most taxpayers who are sending money outside the country to support relatives. The only way a worker can respond if it happens to him is to file a prepare a complaint form, that's form 14157, or a preparer can file 14157A to report these preparers. They can also seek assistance from the Taxpayer Advocate Service. Some help is available at some low-income taxpayer clinics, but many who are funded by Legal Services Corporation are only able to provide very limited assistance to H-2A workers because they're not U.S. residents under immigration law. Um, Bob, I just wanted to point out that we've got some questions in the chat if you want to address them now or um, save them for the, for the end. Okay, the two questions I've seen are what is considered unaffordable? And I tried to answer that. It's if the insurance through the marketplace is more than 8.13% of the worker's income, it's considered unaffordable. And the other one has to do with the failure to file penalties applying to states. The penalties I cited are federal penalties. Uh, I am not conversant with state penalties uh, and social security. All W-2s are to be sent to the Social Security Administration. There is a state copy in Idaho. They're supposed to send them to the state of Idaho as well. But uh, there's no enforcement mechanism in Idaho to put penalties there. I can't address other states. <clears throat> 
<coughs> even those who filed tax returns in the past are often victimized by inadequately, inadequately trained or unscrupulous preparers. They'll use the wrong tax form, filing an NR when it should be a resident return. They'll make false claims, and they fail to claim available benefits. They, when they don't get expected refunds, they don't know why and don't know how to find help. The IRS may be sending them letters, but they don't get them, either because they're no longer in the United States when the US letter is sent to a U.S. address or because the letter is sent to a foreign address and just never gets there. When they do get letters, they seldom understand them and f frequently don't reply to them. And there's one other issue. If someone has filed a return with any filing status other than married filing joint for that worker, and the married filing joint is the correct return, they only have three years from the date the return was originally due to file an amended return to make it a joint return. After that, they're out of luck. They would have to file a married filing separate return, or if eligible, a head of household return. Now, keep in mind that even though a foreign worker is in the United States, maybe for 10 or 12 months, a sheep herder for up to three years, they, if they, that sheep herder has children in Mexico that he can claim as dependents, he can file a head of household return as long as they live in his main home with him in the home he provides the support for. The question often comes up from workers, why should we bother to file and pay? Well, one answer is, is to comply with federal and state law. They should be aware that employers must report their wages and eventually either the IRS or the state tax, revenue, state tax agency is going to figure it out and come after them to enforce the law. Failure to file and not withholding or making estimated payments will also add costly penalties to the tax due when they get caught or when they finally get around to filing. And one of the biggies is when immigration reform is eventually enacted, agricultural workers will be at the head of the line. They have been in all past proposals but in all past proposals, there's also been a provision that anyone who has been working in the United States and wants to get a change in status through immigration reform will need to have filed tax returns for five years if they've been here that long. In other words, they're going to have to show tax compliance. The law requires a tax return for every individual having a gross income which equals or exceeds the exemption amount. Now we get to add to that statutory deductions like the standard deductions and exemptions based on filing status. But you have to keep in mind until you file a tax return, the IRS doesn't know what your status is. They don't know if you're married filing a joint return or if you're single, nor do they know if you're a non-resident alien or a resident alien if you happen to be an alien. From the W-2 that the IRS gets, they don't even know that the taxpayer is an alien. The law requires that non-resident and dual status aliens filing is the exemption amount. That's the filing threshold. So anyone in 2016 who made $4,051 or more had a filing requirement if they've never filed before or if they're going to file as a non-resident. Resident workers 
may claim the standard deduction and the exemptions that raise their filing threshold. Thus, once a foreign worker files a married filing joint tax return, the filing threshold for them becomes 20, over $20,000. However, let's go back and talk a minute about the Affordable Care Act. If that same worker has gone into the marketplace and gotten health insurance, it doesn't matter what their income is, they're going to have to file a tax return to reconcile the advanced premium tax credit they received with the amount they're eligible for based on their actual income at the end of the year. Recalling, of course, that that advanced premium tax credit was based on what they estimated their income to be when they applied for the insurance. And that last bullet, they are required to obtain health insurance if they're not covered by an employer's policy. H2A workers should consider some of these factors. They may be asked about tax compliance when being interviewed for a future visa. Will they be able to answer truthfully and with credibility? We have anecdotal evidence that some workers have been denied entry after they were asked about taxes. There is no checklist and no requirement for State Department employees conducting these interviews to ask about taxes and they have no authority to ask the IRS about a guest worker's compliance. That is all protected by law. Although tax law is complex, there are options and benefits which reduce and sometimes eliminate H-2A workers' tax liabilities. Many who file will not have to pay. And again, when immigration reform is enacted, ag workers will be at the head of the line, but will have to have those five years of returns. Okay, we have, I'm going to get, we have a, a a question here about dependence. I'm going to get to that in a few minutes. Okay. Let's start with a definition of residency. Now, a resident alien under tax law is someone who has a green card. But there's another way. If you don't have a green card, if you're a guest worker, a refugee, an asylee, you're a non-immigrant, but you're subject to the substantial presence test. This test is also applied to aliens who are here without authorization. We'll define that test in a minute. What is a non-resident alien? Anyone who is not a U.S. citizen and is living outside the United States. Anyone who is not a U.S. citizen comes from a foreign country and is living in the United States, but it's only part of the time and they do not have substantial presence here. Non-resident alien status also applies to foreigners who are in the United States who are exempt from this substantial presence test by law or treaty. All those diplomats at the UN are here sometimes for years on end. People who work in the foreign consulates of Mexico, Colombia, El Salvador, any foreign consulate, they're all exempt by law. We have other people that are exempt by law. Students who come on J-1 and J-2 visas, F-1 and F-2 visas, and so forth. The F-2, by the way, is just the spouse of the F-1 holder. They're exempt by law for a certain period of time. But we're going to focus today on the immigrant guest worker, the non-immigrant guest worker, and to a lesser degree, the undocumented worker. Now, there's a third status for tax reporting that's called a dual status alien. And this is a someone who's was a resident alien part of the year and a non-resident alien part of the year. 
Now, what is substantial presence? It requires physical presence in the United States, defined as 50 states, and U.S. territorial waters, not U.S. possessions, territories, or airspace. Puerto Rico is not considered part of the U.S. for this test. Substantial presence is defined as 183 days during a three-year period. That includes at least 31 days during the tax years and a total of 183 days, counting the current tax year and the two years preceding it. It's an interesting test. Any time during the day is a day of presence. If you're flying in from Peru and you land in the United States at two minutes to midnight, you have your first day of presence in that two minutes. If you leave the United States at one minute after midnight, that too is a day of presence. This is not like counting how many nights you sleep here. All you have to do is be here. Now, some days don't count. People that commute from a foreign country, they cross the border from Mexico to the U.S. and go home at night or into can back and forth between the United States and Canada. Those days don't count. If they're hospitalized and cannot leave because of the hospitalization, those days don't count. And this presentation is not designed to go into all the details. Focus on the 183 days. If you need more details, take a look at Pub 519. Here's why residency matters. Non-residents file a non-resident return. They must file as either single or married filing separate. They do not receive a standard deduction. They get limited itemized deductions, only those deductions related to their U.S. source income. One good example is state income tax that might be withheld from their wages. Residents, on the other hand, file a Form 1040 and are treated like all other U.S. citizens and lawful immigrants. They can have any one of the five filing statuses as long as they meet the requirements for those statuses. They are eligible to claim a standard deduction or may itemize if that's more favorable to them. They may elect to file a joint return with a non-resident spouse. So the worker who is here and who is a resident alien at the end of the year may file a joint return with his wife or her, her, his hus her husband, no matter where in the world they live. However, when that happens, the spouse, the non-resident spouse, is taxed on their worldwide income for the entire year. Sounds scary, doesn't it? But it really isn't. Because, in fact, they can exempt that income as foreign earned income filing a Form 2155. And if it's self-employment income, they are not subject to U.S. self-employment tax. Now, I'm talking here about a non-resident spouse, not in the U.S., who files a joint return with one of our H-2A workers. So they can have income, it's exempt. The only impact of including that income on the return is it could put the H-2A guest worker's income in a slightly higher tax bracket. <laughs> now, dual status aliens don't get the standard deduction. They will, if they're a resident at the end of the year, they will file a Form 1040 and include a statement that revealing their U.S. source income at the time they were non-residents. That statement is usually a Form 1040 that is unsigned, 1040 NR unsigned attached to the return and dual status aliens do not get a standard deduction. Now we're going to talk a little bit about answer the depending questions. 
non-resident H-2A workers may be able to claim exemptions for a spouse and other dependents. Even if they file a married filing separate return, they can get the exemption for the spouse. Here's the rule. The spouse and dependents under that circumstance on a 1040 NR return must live in the United States, Mexico, or Canada. Guest workers coming from under other countries who are non-residents for tax purposes do not have this possibility. The spouse or dependents who are being claimed cannot have income exceeding the exemption amount, which in 2016 is 4050 We rarely ever see that on a guest worker's return, at least not in the H-2A and H-2B categories. The spouse and other dependents must have a tax identification number. They must either have a social security number, which very few will have, or an ITIN, an individual tax identification number issued by the IRS upon application. Now, resident H-2A workers have all the same benefits that are available to U.S. taxpayers. They can file a joint return with a non-resident spouse. Now, saying they can do the same things as all U.S. residents when it comes to dependents, and I'll cover this a little bit later also, that doesn't mean that they can take dependents anywhere in the world, nor can U.S. citizens. There are certain rules on that. To maximize benefits, remember that 183-day rule and the dual status well, the first year you come in, you might not have 183 days. You might only have 160 days. But the second year, when you take that three-year test, you become a resident alien in the second year. The worker can maximize tax benefits by making something called the first-year choice. If they make that first year choice, instead of filing a non-resident return in their first year here, they end up filing a dual status resident return. They become a resident, therefore, and they're still a resident even if they've gone home on December 31st of that year. That gets them the standard deduction in the second year. Otherwise, if they file non-resident in the first year, then they become dual status in the second year, and they go two years without a standard deduction. There are some rules to follow. It's not first year choice is not available to everyone. They have to fit the criteria. The election to file a joint return with a non-resident alien spouse is available to any guest worker who is deemed to be a resident on December 31st of the tax year then they can both be treated as residents for the entire year. It's even available to taxpayers making the first year choice. This provides a married filing joint standard deduction on the tax return for that worker. That's a very generous $12,600 roughly of tax-free income, plus an exemption for the spouse regardless of where she lives or he lives. Again, the exemption requires that the spouse have a tax ID number. It does subject spousal income to U.S. taxes. Quick review, filing status. Resident alien taxpayer can file any one of these file statuses on the left. They can even file a joint return whether or not their wife has a tax ID. The tax ID is required only for the exemption, not to file a joint return. Of course, it will have to be a paper return. Non-resident alien taxpayers can only have two choices. They either file a single if they're not married, or they can file married filing separately if they are married. Deductions. Resident alien taxpayers get to claim the standard deduction and take all itemized deductions available to U.S. citizens. 
non-resident alien taxpayers and dual status taxpayers are not eligible for the standard deduction. Their itemized deductions are limited to state and local taxes, contributions to U.S. Char charities, casualty losses incurred while they are in the United States, and gambling losses up to the amount of their gambling win winnings while they were in the United States. <clears throat> Exemptions, review again. Resident aliens may claim their spouse's exemption no matter where the spouse lives if they file a joint return, if they're filing a married filing separate return, only if the spouse has no gross income. They may claim exemptions for dependents who are U.S. citizens or non-U.S. citizens who are their dependents who reside in the United States, Canada, or Mexico. Again, non-resident aliens may claim a spouse's exemption only if the spouse resides in Canada, Mexico, the U.S., or South Korea, and the spouse has no gross income. South Korea is in here because of a U.S. tax treaty with South Korea. Mexican and Canadian non-resident aliens may claim exemptions for dependents who are U.S. citizens or other dependents who are living in the United States, Canada, or Mexico. So, but what makes a dependent? Generally, there are five tests. Right now, we actually have two types of dependents. They're called qualifying children and qualifying relatives. But I've gone back to the five basic tests just to give you an impact because it fits almost all guest workers and their exemption, depend, exemption claims. The relationship must be a close relative, child, parent, grandchild, sister, brother, aunt, uncle, niece, or nephew, or an individual who lives in the taxpayer's household for the entire year. This is an important one because many guest workers have a significant other but are not married. They can claim a dependent exemption if they are from Mexico and their significant other lives in their main home in Mexico, usually with their children, for the entire year. To claim any exemptions in Mexico, the taxpayer generally must provide more than half the financial support for each dependent claimed. There's a gross income test. A dependent cannot have income equal to or greater than the exemption amount, which was $4,050 in 2016. This exemption amount is waived for children under the age of 19 or children under the age 24 who are full-time students. So if those two situations, the children can earn more than $4,050 and still be claimed by their parents on a tax return. The residency test, I've mentioned this before, in order to claim a dependent, that dependent must be a U.S. citizen or live in the United States, Canada, or Mexico. What does living in the U.S. entail? They have to meet that same substantial presence test that the taxpayer meets. And here's another one. A taxpayer, if married, a dependent. Dependent, if married, cannot be filing a joint return except to claim a refund. You don't see that very often. Many guest workers will be claiming parents. Uh, we did run into one problem the other day where a guest worker has his parents. He was supporting his parents, but he also had a daughter who was claiming his mother on their tax return. And we're not sure how that's going to file out because the daughter probably did not have a legal basis since she, if she was not sending money and providing more than half the mother's support to even consider it. Timing on tax returns is important. If a taxpayer is, doesn't file a timely return, 
the penalty is 5% per day per month on any unpaid balance on that return. So if they don't file on April 15th, by May 15th, they owe 5% more, June 10%, July 15%, August 20%, and September 25% penalty is added on. This can be avoided by filing an extension. If the taxpayer is not in the U.S. on April 15th, they can file by June 15th and claim an automatic extension by putting a statement on the return. Unfortunately, nobody reads those statements. Everything's done with computers and scanners. So they'll still be assessed a penalty and they'll have to write another letter later. It's much better to have someone file the extension for them before April 14th on IRS Form 4868. Some states require a separate extension request. This saves late filing penalties, but not late payment penalties. The late payment penalty is one half of percent of the unpaid balance on the federal return instead of the 5%. So it's well worth having someone file that extension for you. The extension does not have to be signed. Just leave a note with the employer or someone you trust to get this taken care of and ask that extension be filed. Does not need your signature. Another thing that could offset late filing and late payments is having enough withholding or estimated payments sent to the IRS so that you will not owe tax on April 15th. If no tax is due on the filing date, there are no penalties. Withholding, of course, is voluntary. Paying as you go is not. So even though the with holding worker is exempt from withholding, they are required to file estimated taxes. The threshold for that requirement is owing tax of $1,000 or more. The pain threshold for a worker coming back to the United States, not having had a paycheck for three or four or six months, and now getting his first paycheck and filing a tax return and owing $500, it could be more than they could stand. So they should be considering estimated taxes or withholding with thresholds lower than the legal $1,000 threshold. We don't recommend withholding in the first couple of years because there's no account for that W-2 to go into until the first tax return is filed. Therefore, we recommend estimated payments. The IRS is now looking at tax returns, and if they don't match the tax return with a W-2 when it comes in, they have two programs that freeze refunds that might be claimed and stop the processing and subject the taxpayer to inconvenience. Many guest workers are getting caught up in this because their social security cards are new. The W-2 is coming in before the IRS has established an account from the taxpayer. And the W-2 does not establish an account. The only two things that a worker can do to establish account with the IRS is to file that first tax return or send in an estimated payment with a meaningful amount. By meaningful, I would say at least $50. <clears throat> when the IRS establishes a recount based on an estimated payment or a tax return, then they create a, an individual master file account for that worker. Now they have some place to put the worker's W-2 when it comes in from the employer. But as I said, it does not establish these returns until it gets a tax return or an esti pay, estimated payment 
on a form 1040 ES for resident workers or 1040 NRES for non-resident workers. Okay, let me take a look at the questions. Bob, this is Danny. Yes. I just wanted to point out, and just to make sure you know if you hadn't seen it, there were questions in the, the chat function as well in the Q&A. Okay, I have the Q&A. I don't even have the chat function opened. So okay. how do I get that open? It should be down at the bottom of the screen on the bar. It says chat. Just click on that and it'll bring up a... a okay, I have participants, do share, pause share, annotate, remote control, more. Uh, chat. Oh, wow. 41 on chat. <laughs> so there are, I don't think there's that many questions, though, but take a look at that. Uh, oh, most see. of them, the, yeah. there, there are about five or six questions at the bottom of that. So scroll down. Okay. And, and okay, just so you I'm, know, I'll, it's 105, but I think we had this reserved till 2 o'clock. So you'd mentioned maybe going over. So feel free. I can keep, I'll monitor that. Okay. Okay. You go as long as you down. Okay. Okay, there's one question here. Uh, if a worker doesn't get an SSN for about a month and the employer makes backup withholding during this time, should the employer issue a 1099 and a W-2? Well, the big thing is, is the employer should not be doing backup withholding. The employer should be facilitating the uh, that worker getting an SSN. And I don't see any reason why they should do. If they do do backup withholding and then they stop it uh, before the W-2 is due, they now have a social, pay the worker the withholding that was backed up because now he has a number so the bottom line is, even if the worker doesn't have a number, when it's time to file the W-2, well, and if you, have, if you have done backup withholding and you haven't facilitated the worker getting a, an SSN, uh, there's something wrong. Uh, and... If you've done backup withholding and he gets the worker gets a W-2 before either one of them has to be filed, just give the worker back the amount that was backup withheld, withhold only the amount he has volunteered for and issue only a W-2. Uh, I think I answered some of this, but besides penalties, what are the consequences for workers not filing? Uh, yes, they can have wages garnished if the IRS files a return for them. Uh, this was especially problematic when, w, when W-2s weren't being used, but 1099s were because the IRS would always hit them with self-employment tax plus income tax and their filing status would be single. So they got no benefit, even if they were eligible to claim exemptions or file a joint return. Uh, will they not be granted a visa? That is a difficult question to answer because it all depends on what the State Department interviewer asks when they come in for their visa and how they respond. The State Department, as I said before, does not have access to their tax records. The IRS doesn't need a reason. So sometimes the marketplace sends out 1099s that have errors. Yeah, we see a lot of that. Uh, they can take a long time to correct. The IRS does not give extensions for a reason. You can file anytime before April 15th an automatic extension on this form 4868 that gives you until October 15th 
No reason needed. They will not waive late filing penalties for people that are waiting on a corrected form of any kind. The IRS answer is you should have filed an extension and you should have estimated what you paid due. If you knew what was wrong with the form, you could have created the return as the corrected form would show and know if you owed money, send in the money, file the extension. That's the IRS position on that one. Now I said, did the H-2A worker claim children as dependents as long as they live with the worker? Okay. Well, they don't have to live with the worker. An H-2A worker, anyone who has to file a U.S. tax return can claim a child as an exemption because they meet the qualifying relative test. The difference with living with them and not living with them is the difference of having a qualifying child and an other relative under tax law. The key thing for H-2A workers is they can only claim children that live in the United States, Canada, or Mexico unless they're a U.S. citizen. And so we have H-2A workers who are supporting children that live with their mothers, just as we have men in the United States who are supporting children and they don't live with their, the mothers of the children and they're paying child support. We have H-2A workers voluntarily sending money for child support and they can claim those exemptions as long as they're providing more than half the support for the child who lives in that household. Now that requires technically someone to examine how much income is in that household, where the other support is coming from that child, and does it end up that the worker is providing more than half that child's income. But yes, he doesn't have to live with them in the foreign country to claim them. Bob, are you there? Hello? Okay, I'm here again. When oh. did I drop off? Oh, about, I'd say like 10, 15 seconds ago. Okay. I was just going to say, somebody asked about where, there's a difference between a U.S. citizen and a legal permanent resident. U.S. citizens can be claimed as exemptions no matter where in the world they live. Legal permanent residents, because they're not U.S. citizens, have to live in the United States, Canada, or Mexico if they're claimed. So if you have a legal permanent resident who has moved back to Mexico, they can be claimed. If that legal permanent resident moves to Guatemala, El Salvador, back to Peru, they cannot be claimed, even though they retain legal permanent resident status. <coughs> There's a new, there's a correct question here about what is best for an H-2A worker who is married with dependents to file as head of household, okay? It's best for that worker to file as head of household when they have children they can legally claim because they live in their main home, which means they have to live in Canada or Mexico. It's usually best for them to file married filing jointly. However, if for one reason or another, it's inconvenient to get a signature from the spouse on that tax return, then go ahead and file ahead of household. Remember, you've got three years to amend to a married filing joint. Getting signatures for spouses in foreign countries is problematic, but the spouse can sign a power of attorney, IRS Form 2848, giving her husband 
the authority to sign the tax return for her. This can be done for any tax year in the past, up to including three tax years in the future. We are filing 2016 tax returns this year. So powers of attorney being signed by spouses enabling the guest worker to sign a tax return on the non-resident spouse's behalf can be sent in today for tax years through 2019. Come 2019, we have to get a new power of attorney that will get us through 2022. So it's hard to say when it's best. Uh, remember, the dependents are only this question is when is it best for them to file as head of household only applies to workers who come from Mexico or Canada. Others don't have the option of filing a head of household return. Yes, there is that penalty for paying late. It's one half percent a month plus interest. And if they end up setting up an installment agreement, they'll have to pay for the privilege. Oftentimes we can get a non-collectible status. We have a mixed bag. Some we're doing offers in compromise for. They have a huge amount of back taxes to pay in the past. They want to get current on everything. We'll file an offering compromise. And basically because of their income, levels of income when it's low enough and their lack of assets, we can get fairly low offer amounts approved. Taxpayers who do not come from Mexico often have higher taxes, especially those from South Africa and European countries. They tend to get higher paying jobs. A sheep shearers from Uruguay, we see some of them getting fifty, sixty, seventy-five thousand dollars a year because they're very good. Those kinds of incomes generally do not get uh, help. They have to pay their back taxes, file installment agreements. And yes, it is sad but true. H-2A workers are not treated fairly based on the country they come from. Nothing about tax law is necessarily fair or equitable. The law reads that only U.S. citizens and residents of Canada and Mexico can be claimed as dependents. So workers with dependents in El Salvador, Guatemala, Uruguay, Peru, cannot claim their dependents. And in Peru, they don't have common law marriage. So if they are not married to a, the mother of their children, they don't get to file a joint return. In Uruguay, they do have common law marriage. So the Uruguayan worker who comes to the United States is not married to the mother of his children, can still find that joint return because of the common law marriage, but cannot claim his children as dependents because they're not residing in the United States, Canada, or Mexico. Let's talk a bit about tax identification numbers and tax compliance challenges. Getting these items is tricky. The IRS has gotten very nitpicky and detail-oriented. That leads to rejected applications. There is a requirement to send original documents to the IRS. And for foreign workers, the IRS will no longer allow them to use certifying acceptance agents to facilitate getting ITINs for their spouses and their children who do not reside in the United States. Under the PATH Act of 2015, every applicant from a foreign country has to send original documents to the IRS. If you want to have someone assist them, that person must get 
a power of attorney from the applicant. There are no rules for this written out anywhere, but in a series of emails I've exchanged with the ITIN program office, this is the way it fleshes out. Whoever the applicant is, is the person who gives the tax return, the tax, the power of attorney. So they are the grantor. That name goes in box one. That's going to be the same name and address that is contained in on the W-7 application. The person who signs that is going, if an adult, is going to be the person who's applying for the ITIN. They can have a relative represent them, a spouse. Otherwise, they'll need someone who is a CPA, enrolled agent, or an attorney to do their representation. If the applicant is a child, the child's name goes in box one of the power of attorney. That name is going to be the name, same name as the child on the W-7. The power of attorney will be signed by the same person who signs the W-7 application. Remember that parents can sign the W-7 application for a child. So it stands to reason that a parent can sign a W-7 application, or a power of attorney application on the child's behalf. Now, on the power of attorney form, in box four, you put the check box because this is not a power of attorney that is going to be entered into the CAF system, the centralized authorization file. It only goes attached to the W-7 to the ITIN operation in Austin. It has no other purpose. You're going to put in the year of application as the year covered. You're going to put ITIN application as the tax matter, form W-7 as the form, and again, the year the application is being submitted as the period. Other problems is we've discussed before, not having a year round address, not being able to react to IRS correspondence. Legal and cultural expectations don't match the experience in their home country. And the unreliable and time consuming methods of corresponding between work and home place. We always recommend using some kind of express service, DHL, FedEx, UPS, whichever agency services the home country the best is the one to use rather than international mail. Applying for ITIN and renewing ITINs. <clears throat> the Form W-7 is available in Spanish. Documentation is required to establish alien status and true identity. Each person who needs an ITIN, be it the taxpayer, the spouse, often called the secondary taxpayer, but could also be a dependent, and each dependent requires an individual application. A parent or guardian can sign for a minor, generally under age 14. All others sign their own or give a power of attorney to a designated representative who must be a relative, attorney, CPA, or enrolled agent. W-7s are generally submitted with a tax return or an amended tax return. I have 1040 or 1040X, but it could also be a 1040 NR. Follow-up requires either that power of attorney or an information disclosure form. I say here, unless you are a certifying acceptance agent, that is no longer true because we cannot assist taxpayers who do not live in the United States obtain an ITIN. 
Hopefully, Congress will correct that, but I don't know. What are acceptable documents? National ID card, civil birth certificate, a U.S. state ID card, driver's license, a visa, American visa, foreign tax, voter registration card, a U.S. driver's license, a foreign driver's license, a military ID card, a foreign military ID card, as long as it has a photo on it. Remember, these all have to be photo IDs except the birth certificate or the school records as we have down here below. School records and medical records are only for dependents. If you don't submit a passport, one of the documents must be a birth certificate. It must be an original or a certified copy issued by the same government Bureau of Vital Statistics that issued the original. The IRS is going to look for specific security features in that document. And I should say that because of the fraud with the child tax credit, birth certificates for children get enhanced examination. Medical records may be used for children under age five or age, age five and younger. A medical record is defined as a vaccination record which documents the patient's name, the child's name, date of birth, complete address with chronological dates of medical history and care the name and address and phone number of the doctor, hospital, or clinic where treatment was last administered. I have never seen a vaccination record that provided all that information. Therefore, to accompany the vaccination record, the medical record must have on it all of that information, and it must be signed and dated on official letterhead from whatever government agency, physician, hospital, or clinic where they get their shots or they get their medical treatment. If that W-7 shows a U.S. date of entry, the record must be from a U.S. facility. In other words, if you're saying that the child has come to the United States on the Form W-7, you're going to have to show that the medical record or school record indicates that the child is in the United States. Passports for children who are in foreign countries must be accompanied by other evidence that they are in the foreign country, not in the U.S., when they're submitted. Any, since the PATH Act was passed, It must be clear that so they have to send in a, a school record or a medical record as well as the passport. Uh, if you submit a passport for a from someone from a foreign country whom you're claiming is in the U.S., again, get a school record from a U.S. school or a medical record from a U.S. facility to accompany the passport. School records accepted only for dependents under age 18. That is defined as an official report card or transcript signed by a school ministry or official. The record must contain the student's name, coursework with grades, school name and address. The exception on coursework and grades, these are not required for children under age 16 who, six who are in kindergarten or preschool. There's a bubble for six-year-old children who are not yet in the first grade. Go ahead and submit them. The ITIN program office has told the ITIN operation that these are acceptable if they are still in kindergarten or preschool, but you may have a problem. Again, if the W-7 shows a date of entry into the U.S., the record must be from a U.S. facility. Here's my contact information again. And let me go back and talk a bit about renewals. 
right now, everyone whose ITIN was issued before December 31st, 2008, under the law, has had their, deact their ITIN deactivated. The IRS couldn't cope with that. There were about 11 and a half million ITINs in that group. So the IRS has only deactivated ITINs that have middle digits of seven, eight, or seven, nine. Those ITINs must be renewed. People renewing those ITINs, if they are not in the United States, must renew by submitting the same original documents as they would have submitted for a new ITIN. Married women who in the past have used their husband's name on their ITIN, when they renew, must, if they want to continue using their husband's name, must include the marriage certificate. Otherwise, the only way the ITIN will be issued is with the name that is on the passport or the birth certificate submitted with the application. There is a new form that was published in December in September of 2016 for ITIN renewals. Do not use any other form to try to get a renewal. On the top part of the form, there's a checkbox where you say if this is a new application or a renewal. Is a question here about the, let me go back to the renewals. Uh, I said seven, eight, and seven, nine are now deactivated. It is now the end of April. The IRS still hasn't told us when the second wave of the activations are going to be eligible or are going to be deactivated. The fact of the matter is that anyone who has an ITIN that is going to be active, deactivated at the end of this year may now apply for a renewal whether or not their did middle digits are seven, eight or seven, nine. And I rec recommend that they go ahead and do it. We have been successful in getting renewals for many whose ITINs were deactivated by law, but are still being recognized by the IRS. Uh, we believe this will help them if they ever have to take an examination dispute with the IRS to tax court. We do not know when the IRS is going to officially deactivate the rest of the ITINs. We do know that under the PATH Act, ITINs issued prior to January 1st, 2010 are deactivated at the end of 2016. What the IRS is going to do with that, they haven't told us. Should we advise workers via social media that is to print out and have their spouse sign their Form 28 and bring it with them if they're planning on filing jointly? Certainly have them print out the second page where the signature is for the wife. Then you can pencil in whoever is going to represent them or if it's just going to be the spouse, the spouse can be filled in on the bottom line. Filling out a power of attorney for authorizing someone to sign a tax return requires that in box five, an explicit statement be included. And that explicit statement comes right from the code. And you can take it out of the IRM as well. Uh, I will send Danny a copy of one that has that statement in it. When we filled it out, we actually had to use Adobe Acrobat to get the last three words in because it really doesn't fit in the space and the font that the form fillable 2848 provides. But 
yes, if you can reach workers through social media to tell them what they will need, the 2848 is a very big thing that they can have their wives bring, but also the documents they're going to need for iTunes, a W-7 form that has been signed by the applicants if they're going to be claiming parents, a spouse, W-7 could be signed, a, the older children can sign, a parent can sign their W-7 applications, and their powers of attorney for IT assistance. All that can be done and brought back with them. It saves the hassle of sending things back and forth. And fortunately, after the fact, you can type up most of the information on the form fillable page one of the power of attorney. Uh, I wouldn't disclose that to someone in the IRS that that's the way it was done because they might say, well, then this person signed a blank check and we're not going to honor it. But in fact, uh, that's the way it works. I've crammed an awful lot into the last hour and a half. And I hope I've hit the questions. Are there any more that I've missed? Are we still on? I mean, we're still on. <laughs> I think we saw. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, I do want to make one announcement. Apparently, uh, we have access to the email addresses of everybody that signed in. We're just going to uh, automatically send out uh, the PDF files that you sent us and also evaluations to be filled out. I would certainly appreciate the feedback. Uh, this has been a very busy time for us, and we normally have volunteers for our VITA program. We didn't have a single one this year. So <laughs> it's it's been a challenge getting this together for you, and it's had a little bit of uh, repetition in it. Repetition is sometimes good for teaching. It's not good for time. But I hope it was worthwhile your time to, to go through. Oh. If there's any questions anybody has in the future, you have my contact information. Send me an email or a phone call. Bob, thank you. It was very informative. Your your knowledge is, is extensive, and we appreciate you, your willingness to do this for us. Thank you very much. You're all welcome. And if you would, Danny, send me a list of the attendees so I can get her and any feedback that you get. Uh, we have a twice-a-year report we're supposed to give to the LITC program office, which provides about two thirds of our funding on the types of advocacy and outreach we're doing and and who's receiving it and how it was received. So I'd appreciate any feedback we can get. Will do. And right. I believe you said, and if you did uh, record this for rebroadcast, uh, just let me know if it's used in that manner as well. Okay, we will do that, Bob. Thank you so much. And if you wanted me to redo it sometime, and, and based on the feedback we get, I'd be happy to do that as well. Oh, even better. Thank you. <laughs> All right, is that it? All right, we're signing off then. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you. All right. Appreciate yes. the opportunity.